Um, so again, my name is Dr. Rachel White. I am the CBAI Behavior Analysis Services Director at the University of Anchorage, Alaska Center for Human Development. And today's topic is the first of four, and this is going to be covering functions of behavior. We have the next uh, three Saturdays at the same time, 2.30 to 4.30. We have upcoming um, webinars on a couple of different topics. Um, let's see if I can remember them. Um, the next one is reinforcement. And then the week after that is communication. And after that is uh, visual support. Hopefully you'll be able to join us for those and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so first, what is behavior? When we talk about behavior, behavior is anything that a person does. It can be talking, writing, reading, walking, biking, driving, playing, working, eating, anything you can think of. Um, in behavior analysis, we generally talk about the dead man's test. Um, and roughly speaking, if a dead man can do it, it's not a behavior, but anything that a dead man can't do is a behavior. Um, from the behavior analytic perspective, all behavior happens for a reason. Um, we do things to get what we want out of, uh, out of the situation. We go to work so that we can earn money, so that we can buy nice things like houses and cars and clothes and spend um, our money on fun activities that we enjoy. Um, we might read uh, for the sake of just enjoying a good story, or we might read in order to be able to talk about what we read with other people, such as in a book club or reading the newspaper so that you are current, uh, up to date on current events. Um, when we talk about problem behaviors, we're generally talking about behaviors that are inappropriate or disruptive. And those generally fall into three main categories. Um, they occur too much, so this is a behavior that we don't want to occur at all, uh, such as aggression or throwing a tantrum or throwing toys, breaking things. Um, all of those could be examples of, and there are many more, of inappropriate behaviors or disruptive behaviors that occur too much. Um, other type would be occurring too little. So maybe it's a problem because the learner is not making enough eye contact in a social situation or um, is not sharing frequently enough or at all. Um, or in the case of toileting, they're not using the toilet at all and therefore this is a, a problem or a disruptive behavior in uh, through the routine. Um, the third category would be behaviors that are appropriate given some situations, um, but are a problem because they occur in the wrong place or at the wrong time. So changing clothes is a skill that we would like our learners to be independent with. However, we want them to do it behind closed doors, in the privacy of their room, when it is appropriate to um, change their clothes. Uh, laughing at inappropriate situations. So laughter is fantastic. And we're very happy that our kids can um, express their enjoyment um, and their sense of humor. However, there are times when laughing would be inappropriate and would not be the response that we would want. And it would be disruptive. Um, potentially asking questions in the middle of a lecture. We want students to be able to ask questions, but if the teacher has um, is in the middle of presenting and there will be questions at the end, then we would expect that our learners are waiting until the end to ask their questions and not asking questions in the middle of a lecture or interrupting the teacher when they're giving the lesson. 
So is behavior a form of communication? Um, and I'm going to walk through the logic of this. So we know that all behavior happens for a reason. We don't do things unless we get something out of it. Um, problem behaviors, therefore, happen for a reason because even though they are inappropriate or disruptive, they are still a behavior and all behavior happens for a reason. Um, problem behaviors are a way of the learner getting something that they want or need. Uh, especially if we're talking about learners whose communication is not um, vocal and they're not able to communicate fluently with us. Um, problem behaviors can be a very effective way of getting something that they want. Therefore, problem behavior is a form of communication. It's not an ideal form of communication. It's certainly not something that we want to continue, um, but we need to realize that inappropriate behavior is still trying to communicate something to us, and it's our job to figure out what the learner is trying to communicate. So for example, a newborn infant um, doesn't do much except for cry, um, and then it's up to the parents and caregivers to figure out what that cry means and what the child needs at that moment. Um, and having been a parent of a newborn at one point, um, it can be very hectic and stressful trying to figure out what the crying infant needs. And so you just go through everything that has worked in the past. Maybe they're hungry. Maybe they're sleepy. Maybe they want to play. Maybe they need to be burped. Maybe they need to be changed. Um, maybe I'll run the vacuum cleaner. And you run through all of the um, possible things that you can think of that this learner, um, in this case, it, this, this child, this infant, might need to meet their needs because all they can do is cry. They can't tell you what they need. Um, and what we'd like to do, what we're going to try and do with this, um, with this webinar is give you some information on better ways to determine what those problem behaviors are trying to communicate, what your learner needs, and therefore you can be more successful at um, helping them achieve what they want with appropriate behaviors um, and not have to run around guessing what the problem is. So what is the behavior trying to tell us? Um, what we get from the behavior, that's what we call the function. So the function of a behavior is going to be um, whatever the learner is getting from that uh, interaction. Um, we'll talk about what those possible things could be, um, but we do want to focus on the current events, not necessarily the first instance of problem behavior when we're looking at identifying the function. So for example, um, a child may be um, learning to use the restroom, may use the restroom in a public space where there are a lot of loud noises, the flushing is automatic, it surprises them, it startles them, it scares them, um, and then they have a negative reaction towards the sound of a flushing toilet in the future. Um, that may be important information to know and to understand when behaviors first occurred so that we can work through those. However, we'd want to look at what the current situation is. So if our target behavior is flushing the toilet and currently the problem is that the learner is screaming and crying and not flushing the toilet, we might look and see that screaming and crying leads to them getting to leave the bathroom and not hear that. Um, and therefore the function can be them getting out of a task. Um, so our goal is looking at what the, why is the behavior continuing to occur, not just um, the first time that it occurred. Um, and that's important to look at because things can occur, behaviors can occur and they can result in a consequence and never occur again because that natural consequence um, 
wasn't what the learner wanted. It didn't work out for them. Um, I know when I was a kid, I tried to uh, tried to do a, a bicycle stunt or something and take my hands off the handlebars and I flipped my bike and knocked out my front teeth and um, never tried that again. That um, was a consequence that, you know, in, in and of itself, I, um, I never uh, wanted to try to do um, the uh, crazy bike tricks anymore. So the first instance doesn't necessarily mean that a behavior is going to uh, continue. If a behavior is continuing, then it's serving a function for that learner. It's happening for some reason, they're getting something out of it, something good, or they're avoiding something that they uh, don't want. So why do we want to know what the function is? Um, two reasons, basically. Uh, we want to know what the learner is getting out of the situation so that we can teach a more appropriate replacement behavior um, and give them a way to get what they want more appropriately. Um, the second reason we want to know what the function is is so that we don't accidentally reinforce and continue to reward the inappropriate behavior. Um, if I, if a learner is engaging in some disruptive behavior in a classroom because they don't want to do math and the consequence is that the teacher sends the learner out into the hall and they miss math class, the teacher may be thinking that they are reprimanding and disciplining the learner because they're not in the classroom, they're missing out. But the learner may look at it as, hey, I got what I wanted out of this. This is even better. So we need to know the function so that we don't accidentally continue to support those inappropriate behaviors. All right, so what are the common functions of behavior? Um, one easy way to think of it is everybody eats. So the common functions of behavior start with the letters E, A, T, and S. E stands for escape. Um, this can be getting out of a particular task or having to do some work. Um, it could be leaving a particular environment. Um, it could also be avoiding something that's coming up next or avoiding certain people or certain situations. Um, so although we say escape, it can also include um, avoiding. Um, the difference being is that escape is the situation is already occurring and they want um, to stop that situation. Um, avoiding would be it predictably is coming up soon and they are engaging in behavior so that they don't have to encounter it. Um, the A in eats, for everybody eats, is attention. Um, attention can take a lot of forms where uh, humans are very social and we live in social societies. And so attention could be just to get a reaction, um, to get a laugh, to annoy somebody, to push their buttons. Um, it could also be to get someone to come over and spend some one-on-one -on -one time with them, especially if we're talking about learners who have um, needs that require supports. Uh, sometimes those inappropriate behaviors are their ways, uh, it can be a way to recruit additional help for an activity or additional support during an activity, or just have someone close by if they're used to always having someone close by to them. The T stands for tangible. And this is gonna be something that you can hold, something that you can do. Um, it could be a toy, it could be an activity, um, playing video games, going to the park, um, or it could be uh, things that we might consider fidget toys or um, items that are designed to redirect a learner. Um, or give them something to fiddle with while they are supposed to be doing something else. And again, if we're talking about learners who may have limited communication skills, they might may not know how to request those items, and therefore they may be engaging in inappropriate behavior that results in someone else bringing out additional fidget toys or supports or activities for that learner.
Um, the S stands for self-stimulation. Um, this can cover a wide variety of things. Um, so it could be that someone is engaging in a behavior to relieve pain. Um, if I have a sinus headache, I might pinch the bridge of my nose, um, and that may provide some temporary relief. Um, they might be engaging in a behavior to produce a sensation. Um, so they might hum to themselves um, so that they can hear it or feel the, the vibration in their throat. Um, and the main key to thinking of self-stimulatory behavior and determining whether or not something is self-stimulatory is that it happens even if nobody else is around or intervenes. Um, so one common thought is that some behaviors based upon the way that they look, like hand flapping or finger flicking, could be um, what is often labeled as sensory, could be meeting a sensory need. Um, if those behaviors are meeting a sensory need, uh, so producing a sensation for a learner, then they're going to be engaging in those behaviors even when they're alone, even when no one's interacting with them. Uh, versus sometimes learners can uh, learn to engage in some behaviors that look like sensory type of behaviors or self-stimulatory behaviors, except that they only do it in certain situations. So if the learner only engages in hand flapping um, when they're presented with a demand um, and they never do hand flapping when they're on a break, um, it's highly likely that that is not a self-stimulatory um, function, that it serves a function maybe such as escape. So again, the common functions of behavior, E-A-T-S, everybody eats, escape, attention, tangible, and self-stimulation. So how do we identify the functions of behavior? Um, oftentimes we take what is called ABC data. Um, it's done that way so we can remember what each letter stands for. Um, the A stands for antecedent or trigger. So this is what the specific incident was that started the behavior, that set off the inappropriate behavior. Um, it could be something that is in the external environment, so there's a loud noise, or somebody's asked them to do something, or a new person comes into the room, um, or it could be something that only that learner experiences, such as being hungry or tired um, or having a headache. Uh, we don't want to disregard the learner's internal antecedents. Um, and certainly if I suddenly got a headache, I would react differently um, than if I didn't have a headache. So we do want to make sure that we are trying to take into account um, something that could be internal to the learner, although we also want to make sure we're looking at what's going on in the learner's environment um, and not just um, assuming that everything is happening inside the learner's body. The B stands for behavior. So this is how did the individual act? What was the specific inappropriate behavior that we are trying to determine the function for? Um, we want to describe it with specific actions and words. So instead of saying, my kid threw a tantrum, I could say, she threw herself down on the ground, she cried, there were tears, she kicked on the floor while she was on the ground that would give you a better picture as to what this kind of a tantrum looked like for this learner in this situation. Um, not everybody's tantrums look the same, and we want to make sure that when we're describing behavior, we're describing exactly what occurred and not, um, not putting too big of a label on it. Same kind of a thing might occur when we say, um, when a teacher reports a student is being disrespectful. Well, what precisely are they doing that is um, being labeled as disrespectful? 
Are they um, responding with an inappropriate tone of voice? Are they name calling? Are they not making eye contact? I mean, what is it in particular that the teacher is finding disrespectful? That way we can look at those behaviors and identify what that, um, what the appropriate behaviors should be instead. Um, the C in ABC data stands for consequence. And this is what happens immediately after the behavior. Um, so I gave an instruction, my toddler threw herself on the ground, and the immediate consequence was I said, looks like somebody needs a nap, and I took her to take a nap. Um, you wanna look at the consequence from the learner's perspective because our goal is to figure out what they're getting out of the situation. So from, um, given that example, um, in my example from the parent perspective, I might think, oh, okay, she's tired, I need to give her a nap, that way she's more likely to follow instructions in the future. And that may absolutely be um, correct, she may be tired and we do want to consider those things. From the learner's perspective, it could be that my toddler has decided, mommy tells me to do something I don't want to do, I scream and cry, and then I don't have to do it. So we do want to look at things from the learner's perspective um, and see what they're getting out of it. What did they receive or what was removed from their environment? So that is our ABC data, antecedent behavior and consequence. So we're going to walk through some examples. So those of you that can type into chat, get your typing fingers ready, and I'm going to um, give you a chance to type in some of these answers. So here's our first example. Johnny is seven years old and engages in verbal outbursts during class. When Johnny's teacher tells Johnny what to work on or how to do something, Johnny yells out the opposite of what the teacher said. So that's our behavior there. Um, for example, uh, Johnny's teacher said, time to sit down. Johnny would yell out, time to stand up. Johnny's verbal outburst disrupt the classroom by drawing his peers' attention and making them laugh. Now, I think this is only going to reveal one at a time, so let's see. Oh, nope, it doesn't. All right, <laughs> we'll walk through this one and then I'll pause it on the next one. Um, so the antecedent would be that the teacher is giving an instruction. The behavior in this case would be yelling, yelling out the opposite of what the teacher said. And the consequence would be that he gets his peers' attention, which again is a form of attention from our everybody eats. Um, all right, so let's look at another example, and I won't click to the next slide so that you guys can actually give it a try. So example number two, Jack is four years old and engages in bolting or running away from his parents when they are in public. He will also open the door to the house and run outside if no one is watching him. He does not respond to instructions to stop or come back. His parents chase him until they physically catch him, and then they hold his hand to take him back to the appropriate area. So those of you that can type, what do you think the antecedent is in this situation? You can type into the um, chat box. Okay, so I'm seeing some access to outside, being outside, leaving, running. So the antecedent is gonna be what happens before he runs away. Um, he would be out in public. Um, when he's inside, it could be that he is, nobody's watching him. Um, I'm seeing uh, some other comments, maybe he's excited. Um, we don't know from the example uh, whether or not it could be that he is um, experiencing something internal, uh, but we also want to look at what's going on externally, and externally he's out in public or he is um, near the front door or unattended to. All right, so what would be the 
behavior, I think a lot of people already labeled the behavior, running away, running off, he escapes, he escapes the area, certainly. And then what do we think is the consequence in this scenario? What do the parents do? Yep, they chase him. Sorry, I responded so fast. Yes, you guys are doing it. They chase him, they hold his hand. Um, yeah, somebody says he gets to play chase with his parents. Yeah, if chase is fun, you might um, have to watch for that. All right, um, one second here. There we go. Um, okay, so the antecedent, he's out in public or he's at home unsupervised. The behavior, he's running away from the appropriate area. The consequences, somebody chases him, um, which is could be attention. I mean, also is outside. I know some of you talking in the antecedents were like, you know, he, he seems to be excited to be outside. He wants to be outside. He gets access to outside. Yeah, and we would consider, I, I would put access to outside as a tangible. It's an activity. He gets to go outside and do something. So in this case, this behavior might have multiple functions. And um, even though we have those nice four categories, everything does not always fall into just one of those categories. Um, as this example demonstrates, there could be multiple reasons why an individual is engaging in a behavior. Example number three, Julie is six years old and engages in tantrums when she is told to clean her, her room. Tantrums consist of Julie screaming and throwing herself to the ground. She will also call for someone to come and help her, that it's too much to clean up alone or that it will take too long to do by herself. She will not clean up and will continue to engage in the tantrum behavior until someone comes to her room. When parents come to her room, she stops lying on the ground and screaming and instead asks politely for help. Then they help her clean up. So what would be the antecedent? What's the trigger for Julie, for Julie's behavior. Yeah, I see it a few there. Asked to, to, to clean her room, being told to clean her room. Absolutely. She's given an instruction um, that presumably she doesn't like. What is the inappropriate behavior that she's engaging in? Yes, tantrum, and we labeled that as screaming and throwing herself to the ground. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so um, in the case of uh, if you're with the same individual and you're looking at the same um, problem behavior over and over again, you can define what a tantrum is for that learner, and then you can use that word tantrum over again if it's the same people that look at it. So if I'm talking about my kid, I know what her tantrums look like. So when I, if I want to um, take data on my own child, I can write tantrum, but I want to make sure that I can describe that to somebody else and sometimes the level or intensity of a tantrum can vary. So you definitely want to note, um, you know, if some tantrum reaches a different kind of a level than another one. All right. And what is the consequence? Parents come to her room. Yep. Parents come to her room, parents help her clean up. And so from her perspective, she is getting some attention and she is getting help so she's not having to do all of the work. So escape. So yeah, antecedent, she's told to clean her room. Behaviors, she's screaming, she's throwing herself to the floor. She's definitely not cleaning up, so non-compliance. Um, and the consequence, somebody comes to her room, so she's getting some attention, and they help her clean up. So she's escaping at least parts of that demand or instruction. So for our everybody eats, this would be an E and an A, escape and attention. 
All right, I think I have one more example. Yep, sure do. All right, Jenny is five years old and engages, um, oh, I think I changed this. It says aggression, but I don't think it's aggression anymore. Um, <laughs> Jenny is five years old and engages in, um, we're gonna say non-compliance and protest behavior when brushing her teeth. Given the instruction to brush your teeth, Jenny will initially comply. However, Jenny is learning to clean her teeth and needs prompting to get all her teeth thoroughly. When verbally or visually prompted to get particular areas, Jenny engages in screaming that she already did it. Um, parents will tell her to do it better next time, but will not make her brush correctly at the time. So what is our antecedent here? So some people are saying brushing teeth, but I did see someone say the verbal and visual prompting to get particular areas. So yeah, in this case, we do want to be specific. She'll initially start brushing her teeth, but it's when she's given a reminder or a correction as to, oh, you missed a spot, don't forget to get the back teeth, um, that she engages in, again, it says aggression there at the top, but um, that she engages in her problem behavior. So what is that problem behavior there? I'm gonna say ignore the aggression at the top. Yes, screaming, thank you. <laughs> I'll have to go back and edit this later. Um, and refusal, yes, yeah, she's, not, she's not engaging in the appropriate behavior of getting those areas. So in this case, we do want to be particular. Um, she's being um, asked to get particular areas or given some sort of a correction, receiving some sort of corrective feedback. So it's not just an instruction, but it's that corrective feedback piece when they're verbally or visually prompting her, reminding her to get certain areas that then results in the screaming. What's the consequence for Jenny? What does she do? Yep, she gets out of it. She doesn't have to do it. Um, she doesn't have to get those particular areas. Um, her parents do say, okay, well, you know, try better next time, um, but she didn't have to do it. So from her perspective, she's getting out of having to brush the parts that she, you know, isn't very fluent with. So antecedents, she's corrected on how to brush her teeth, behavior is screaming, and the consequence is she's not being made to do it correctly. So escape. So that gives you examples of how to take ABC data. So if you are working with an individual or your own um, child um, or learner that you're um, looking at problem behavior, this would be a way that you can document some of those situations so that you can use that information to help determine the function. Um, so before we jump into the function-based interventions, um, the, what we're looking for when we take ABC data is going to be patterns. So if I record three different instances, let's say, of um, uh, Julie and her toothbrushing. Um, three different times that we do uh, toothbrushing and every time has a similar pattern. It's when I tell her that she's missed her back teeth and she needs to brush the back teeth. Um, she engages in screaming and then the result is that we say, okay, we'll try better next time, um, but you can be done this time. If I write those out, and I write them in order and I look at them, I can see that there's a pattern. There's certain antecedents that tend to evoke the problem behavior, and there's certain consequences that tend to follow the behavior. Um, what we're doing with ABC data is looking for those patterns because those patterns can suggest um, what the function is for that learner. If the antecedents and the consequences aren't um, 
uh, don't always appear, appear to be routine. Um, if there's a lot of variability, if there's a lot of different things that are occurring um, before and after, um, oftentimes I recommend that we take some more data or we break things down into smaller pieces. Um, so it's not just an instruction, but maybe a particular instruction about math um, uh, goes differently than following particular instructions during PE. Um, the behaviors may be different or the consequences in those environments may be different. Um, however, what you're doing is looking for patterns. And so if you can take some ABC data, um, then you can look and say, well, what's the child getting out of this? What's my learner getting out of this situation? And that's going to help you to put in a function-based intervention. So there are three steps to dealing with inappropriate behavior once you have identified that function. And they are, um, they match with the A, B, and the C. We want to address all three of those areas. Um, so as far as the antecedent, we're gonna walk through each of these in detail. Um, but as far as the antecedent goes, we're gonna look at arranging the environment. So if there are certain activities or certain situations that we know um, tend to evoke this problem behavior, then we want to arrange the environment to decrease the likelihood of using that problem behavior. And remember, the learner is using that problem behavior to get something. Um, so we want to arrange the environment so they don't need to engage in that behavior to get what they're looking for decrease the motivation for engaging in that problem behavior to get the consequence. Um, the behavior itself, we want to teach an alternative behavior. What is a more appropriate way for this learner to get what they want um, that is going to uh, meet the learner's needs but is going to be acceptable in the situation? Um, it has to serve the same function. So if we've determined that our learner is getting out of something, then the appropriate behavior needs to be something that also allows them to get out of it, at least temporarily. Um, and we'll talk about that too. Um, the C at the consequence uh, level, we want to reduce the effectiveness of the problem behavior that they are engaging in. Um, so we don't want to give in to that inappropriate behavior. We want to make that inappropriate behavior ineffective and it doesn't work. It doesn't produce the consequence that they are trying to get out of it. So now we're going to go through each of these steps in more detail. So um, at the antecedent, we're arranging the environment. So the first thing is that you've, if you've identified the function, then Potentially, you can reduce the likelihood that your learner is going to engage in a problem behavior to get something if that something is already available in the environment. Um, excuse me. So it reduces the need for the individual to act out to get what they want because they already have access to it. Um, I'll give some examples, um, but it is going to uh, it is going to depend upon the logistics of some of those things. So if the learner is engaging in inappropriate behavior to escape a situation, then we can um, arrange more opportunities before problem behavior occurs to take a break, um, to run an errand, um, to get up and wiggle. Um, a lot of the schools are now using like brain breaks for an opportunity for the kids to get up and move around. Um, a lot of teachers in classrooms have the kids go from sitting at their desk for a few minutes to then coming to circle, to then back up to their desk, to then going to centers and moving around more. And the idea is that they are getting a break from sitting in their chair and therefore are less likely to engage in the inappropriate or disruptive behaviors that might come from having sat for a long time and needing to get up and move. Um, for attention functions, um, you could be giving more attention in the environment. Oftentimes we fall into the pattern of if the kids are doing what they're supposed to be doing and they're quiet, then we're free to go take care of all of the responsibilities that we need to take care of. However, what that means is that 
if your learner engages in inappropriate behavior to get attention and you're only coming in and checking on them when there's loud noises, when there's disruptive behavior, um, then they're not getting any attention for the appropriate behaviors. Instead, if you're able to provide more attention um, in the midst of doing some of those other activities before they engage in those inappropriate behaviors, then they have less motivation to act out to get your attention because your attention is available fairly frequently. Um, and attention could be a variety of things. It's gonna depend upon the learner and what they prefer, um, but it could be as simple as just looking at them and smiling, um, saying something to them, patting them on the back. Um, a lot of times you'll see teachers walk um, in and out of the desks or the tables at school so that they can comment and be near and provide a little bit of attention to kids um, throughout the classroom. For tangible, um, Ultimately, if, you're in a, if your uh, learner is engaging in inappropriate behavior to get access to something, if they already have access to that item, then they don't need to engage in an inappropriate behavior to get it. Um, so potentially the item could be unrestricted. They could have unrestricted access to it. That's not always an option. Um, so perhaps it could be available often or more often for the learner. Um, so if I had a learner who was um, throwing a fit in the checkout line of the grocery store because they wanted candy, I could reduce the likelihood that that problem behavior occurs by just having candy when we're in the grocery store. Um, they don't need to throw a fit to get it because they already have candy. Now, Candy be an example of something that we can't just have um, unlimited access to. So we do need to, uh, we may not be able to give completely unrestricted access, um, but we might be able to provide access more often so that it is not um, such a rare thing that it only can occur after problem behavior. Now, you might notice that I did not include self-stimulatory behaviors in this. Um, self-stimulatory behaviors are more complex. Um, you want to make sure that you have a professional helping you with those because those behaviors are things that occur um, even when someone is not around. So arranging the environment can be more challenging. However, the idea would be the same, that if you can make the sensation or the stimulation that they are seeking more freely available in their environment, then they wouldn't need to engage in the inappropriate behavior to get it. Um, they could engage in, um, it, it's already available. Um, the best example being that if a learner engages in some self-stimulatory behavior like hand flapping um, when they're bored because there's nothing else to play with, if there was an environment that had a lot of things that they knew how to play with, um, then they would be more likely to engage in those preferred activities um, as opposed to hand flapping. Now, that being said, the, the reality is that um, Many learners who engage in stereotypic behaviors like hand flapping um, don't know how to interact or appropriately engage with the materials and toys that are in their environment. So just having them in their environment may not be sufficient. Another way to arrange the environment um, and again reduce the likelihood that problem behavior occurs is to provide pre-corrects or transition warnings. Um, these may be technical terms for just uh, what you may already be doing, which is telling the learner what you need them to do before it occurs. Um, doing a countdown in five minutes, I need you to clean your room. One more minute and then you have to clean up your room. Okay, now it's time to clean up your room. Um, the transition warning is just going to count down the time until um, a change occurs. A pre-correct is going to tell specifically what's expected before the learner makes an error. Um, so instead of 
I'm going to use the kindergarten class as an example. So instead of the kindergarten teacher taking the kids out in the hall, and then when they're loud and not in line and running down the hall, stopping them and correcting them, instead what the kindergarten teacher could do is deliver a pre-correct. So once everybody's lined up, before she opens the door, um, the teacher says, okay, when we walk down the hall, we're going to keep our hands to our side, we're going to catch a bubble in our mouth and keep our voices off, and we're going to use our walking feet until we get to wherever we're going. Um, so that would be an example of a pre-correct. Uh, it's basically a rule reminder before the learner has a chance to break the rule. And by using these things, a pre-correct and a transition warning, you can again reduce the likelihood that problem behavior um, may occur because now you've warned the learner of what's about to occur and you've told them what's expected. So if it's a matter of um, simply forgetting how you're supposed to behave, you've provided that rule reminder and that can reduce the likelihood of problem behavior. Another way to arrange the environment would be to use something like a four to one praise to reprimand ratio. Um, this will be covered in a little bit more detail when we um, meet next week um, on the webinar on reinforcement. But the idea is to provide attention to appropriate behaviors um, more frequently, significantly more frequently than providing attention to inappropriate behaviors. Uh, the idea being that if the learner is engaging in um, inappropriate behavior for attention, then you are already providing a lot of attention for appropriate behaviors. You're catching them while they're good. Um, and you're providing, in general, the environment provides less attention for those inappropriate behaviors. Um, an example would be at a preschool classroom where the teacher is. Um, commenting on, I like how you're cleaning up the toys, thank you for cleaning up the toys. Um, this learner isn't, so they just don't comment on that. Instead of telling them to clean up, they comment to another kid, pray, I thank you for cleaning up the toys. You guys are doing a great job cleaning up the toys. Potentially, that learner that wasn't cleaning up has now heard that attention is available for the for cleaning up and may already change their behavior. And if not, then the learn the teacher can still come back and say, hey, Johnny, it's time to clean up the toys, and then can provide praise when the learner follows through with that. The overall classroom is receiving, the environment has more praise statements, four more praise statements to any one reprimand, and the overall classroom environment um, attention is easier to get when you're engaging in the appropriate behavior. Um, and like I said, we'll go into a little bit more detail on, uh, on reinforcement and praise and the praise to reprimand ratio um, at uh, the next webinar. And another way to arrange the environment might be visual schedules. Um, so along the lines of transition warnings and pre-corrects, if our learner knows and understands and can see uh, what is expected and what's coming up next, that can reduce the likelihood of inappropriate behavior occurring in particular situations. Um, we will go over uh, visual schedules in more detail when we do our webinar on visual supports, which is May 12th. Um, but in general, this could be pictures, icons, or words that show the order of the activities. Um, this can be more easily understood than just saying what's coming up next. Also having predictable routines, visual schedules can help make those routines more predictable, both for the learner and within the environment. Um, not all of us do well with surprises. Um, I know I certainly uh, don't like when I'm called in a, to a last minute meeting um, and that throws off the rest of my plans for the day. Um, so having those predictable routines, using a visual schedule can help make some of those routines more predictable and less likely to result in inappropriate behavior. Another piece to that that I just personally really like um, is using timers to signal the end of activities instead of just the verbal um, 
instruction that it's time to be done or it's time to clean up. Um, I found, especially for learners um, on the autism spectrum, that um, they are less likely to argue with timers. Um, the timer goes off and it's just a matter of fact versus if um, mom's telling you it's time to move on, we're done with that now, then um, some learners feel like they have more wiggle room and they can argue with that or they can engage in more of those inappropriate protest behaviors. Uh, so again, uh, visual schedules or providing some visual supports, which we'll go into more detail on May 12th, um, but those can also uh, help arrange the environment to reduce the likelihood of problem behavior. So now let's talk about the behavior. Um, when we address the behavior aspect, we want to teach an alternative behavior that works for the learner. So there's some key features that we need to be aware of. Um, we need to select one or more, um, as many as possible, honestly, um, more appropriate replacement behaviors. If we have more ways for the learner to get uh, their needs met more appropriate ways than inappropriate ways, um, then they are more likely to engage in those appropriate behaviors. Um, they have more skills in their repertoire that they can use. If I only know one way to ask for something, um, then I may forget it in a, in a more stressful time or when I need it immediately, but if I have lots of different ways to ask for it, then I may be more likely to select one of those than the inappropriate behavior. It does need to serve the same function as the inappropriate behavior. The learner still needs to get the function or what they want out of it. When we start, um, using a, a function-based intervention and teaching this alternative behavior. We're not looking at those long-term goals yet. Ideally, sure, our goal may be that when I give an instruction, the learner follows it right away. However, right now, when I give an instruction, the learner, um, you know, throws a toy. Instead, let's teach the learner a more appropriate way to get what they want, and then over time, we can work on them following instructions without always getting their way. But when we start, in order to reduce the likelihood of problem behavior, we have to give them a better way to get what they want. So they're already getting what they want on their terms. Now we're gonna teach them how to get what they want, but on our terms, before we work on getting what we want on our terms. We gotta take it in steps. Um, the Alternative behavior also has to be easier than the inappropriate behavior. Otherwise, the learner is not going to put in the effort. Um, one example of this is if I have a learner who has engaged in um, hitting a peer to get a toy, and I want to teach them to request the toy more appropriately, um, if my inappropriate behavior was hitting, but my appropriate behavior is go to the table, select an icon, put it on the sentence strip, pull the sentence strip off, come back to the peer, hand it to the peer, point to the icons, say it, and then wait. They're not gonna do that, <laughs> at least not initially. They are gonna hit because that works better for them and it's easier. So instead, if I want to keep, teach my kid to not um, hit, when they're asking for their turn, I might just teach them to hold out their hand instead. If, if I can't get a verbal request, a vocal request yet, and we need something that could be more complex, um, let's just teach like a sign. Maybe let's teach um, that they hold out their hand for the item or that they point to the item that they want. So the alternative behavior does need to meet the learners, uh, meet the learner's wants and needs. Um, it needs to be easier than the inappropriate behavior. And if we can think of multiple examples, so pointing or sticking out their hand or saying a word, um, those all might be better options and we could teach all of those instead of hitting for the toy. Um, so some examples, an inappropriate behavior. Oh, hey, look, this is the one I just gave. <laughs> um, an inappropriate behavior, hitting to get a toy, um, so access to tangible. Um, a replacement behavior could be pointing at the toy as a request. 
An inappropriate behavior might be throwing the book to get uh, to, to avoid having to do homework or to escape it for the moment. Um, a replacement behavior might be asking for a break or asking for help. Um, the inappropriate behavior might be crying to get mom's attention. A replacement behavior might be asking for mom or tapping mom on the shoulder. So when we teach an alternative replacement behavior, it's best to start with errorless teaching. We want to start by providing the most help and gradually provide less help as their behavior improves and they start to use that behavior more reliably. Um, errorless teaching is good for teaching new skills and it basically just means that you're going to start with a lot of support so that they don't make an error or they're less likely to make an error. Um, you're going to start with a lot of help and then every time after that as long as they're being successful you're going to give a little less help and a little less help and a little less help until they can do it by themselves. Um, the flip side of that, in case you're wondering, would be trial and error, where you give them a chance to try it, and then if they make a mistake, then you go back and provide a little bit of support, and then if they still can't get it, you provide more support, and that can result in more inappropriate behavior because they're failing. Um, they're, they're not getting it correct, they're not getting what they want, and that can produce more frustration and um, result in more inappropriate behavior. So errorless teaching is the way to go when you're teaching a new skill. Um, start with more help and gradually fade out how much help or support you're providing. It's also important to work on the new appropriate behavior outside of those occurrences of inappropriate behavior. I don't want to accidentally teach my kid that after they hit somebody, then they hold out their hand. Um, and you could accidentally do that if the only time you practice holding out your hand for a turn is when they've already hit somebody. So instead, we want to set up opportunities outside of that where we might just practice sticking out the hand and putting in something that they want. And then sticking out the hand and putting in something that they want. And then holding something and prompting them to stick out their hand and then putting it in. So we want to practice it more times outside of the inappropriate behavior to set up some opportunities for them to be successful and practice that skill um, than only working on it when inappropriate behavior occurs so we don't accidentally create a chain of inappropriate behavior then appropriate behavior. Um, and we will go over more um, detail for teaching alternative behaviors when we do the webinar or communication. And the reason I say that is because most often the most socially appropriate way to get your needs met and to get the needs of our learners met is for them to ask. Um, that it may not always be honored and that's obviously something that we need to work on, but if someone asks for what they want and we can understand what they're asking for, then we can at least problem solve if it's not available. If I don't know why my kid is throwing a fit, um, it's harder for me to help them. But if they can ask for what they need, then I can help either provide that or I can help provide solutions that also can get that need met. So we do cover this a lot more in communication. Oftentimes the most appropriate um, alternative behavior is gonna be some form of functional communication. Teach them to ask for a break. Teach them to ask for the Skittles. Teach them to ask for the attention. Um, teach them for, to ask for the video game. Basically, give them some way to ask for what they want or need. And the communication webinar will be on May 5th. All right, so consequences. Um, when we look at the consequence levels, this is definitely going to be the more challenging um, aspect. And this is the part that I think a lot of people struggle with, is what do I do when 
problem behavior occurs. Um, it's great if we can avoid it. And honestly, that's where, uh, that's where we focus our attention when we are putting in a behavior plan. Because if we can reduce the likelihood that the problem behavior even needs to occur in the first place, and we've taught a lot of appropriate alternative ways for the learner to get their needs met, we may, knock on wood, never have to encounter the problem behavior because we've, we've addressed the situation where they don't need to use that behavior anymore. However, it never really goes that smoothly. You still, in, um, you still uh, inevitably end up having problem behavior occur at least sometimes um, while you're working on reducing the motivation and teaching the appropriate um, replacement behavior. So the inappropriate behavior is still gonna occur sometimes because it's a habit for the learner. If nothing else, this is what's worked for them in the past, why wouldn't they continue to do it now? Um, that's why what we need to do at the consequence level is to show them that that way doesn't work anymore. Um, so the biggest piece to this is that you can't give in. You can't give them the function for what they previously were getting that in for that inappropriate behavior. Um, it's going to look different depending upon the function. And it would be, it, it, some of these are more challenging. Um, if any of you guys have heard of an extinction burst, Basically, if you, um, if previously every time the kid cried, they got candy, and then now we're no longer giving candy anymore when the kid cries, an extinction burst is the, it's going to get worse before it gets better part of it. They're going to try harder. Um, the example I like to use is um, a Coke machine. You put the money in the Coke machine, you push the button, you get your Coke. Um, one day you go by, you put your money in the Coke machine, you push the button, and there's no Coke. No one just walks away at that point. <laughs> you push the button again. You might push the button harder. You might hit the coin release. You might bang on the front of it. You might, I mean, obviously people have done it because they have the little stickers, don't shake the machine, because someone sat there and shook the machine, probably trying to get the Coke when it didn't come out when they put their money in. That's an extinction burst. It's trying harder um, because this used to work. Why isn't it working now? And it's essentially trying harder, which is why this piece is challenging for you to implement and you should never just do this piece. You have to include the antecedent and the behavior pieces because otherwise this is even harder. So um, I believe we are going to look at each of these in detail, um, but attention, we would use uh, what's called planned ignoring, and I'll describe what the, that is here in, in the next slide or two. Um, escape, we would continue to present the demand. Tangible, we would not allow access. And just to guys let you just to let you guys know, um, for self-stimulatory behavior, it would involve blocking. Um, which could look different depending upon what the inappropriate behavior is. Um, and again, self-stimulatory behavior is trickier to deal with because how are you gonna block something that occurs when nobody's around? Um, which if you get down to it and it's a behavior that absolutely has to be stopped, um, something uh, self-injurious, for example, um, it usually ends up being some sort of mechanical or chemical restraint. And we definitely don't wanna go there if we can avoid that. Um, the good news is, as far as functions, self-stimulatory behavior is actually um, not as common as the other functions. Um, most behaviors, most inappropriate behaviors, have a social function. They involve another person giving attention or allowing escape or giving access to something. Um, Slight side note there. All right, so don't give in. We're gonna reduce the effectiveness of that inappropriate behavior. So let's look at what that's gonna look like in more detail. So for attention-seeking behavior, so this is why you have to do your ABC data so that you know what the function is so that you can use 
the appropriate strategy to not give in to it. Um, for attention-seeking behavior, the appropriate strategy to not get it in is called planned ignoring. Now, there's a few different ways that you can break up planned ignoring. Um, one is going to be ignoring the learner and the behavior. So if my learner starts screaming right in front of me, I might abruptly turn around and ignore them, ignore their behavior, and um, not respond at all until they're engaging in appropriate behavior. Um, so you wouldn't talk to them, you wouldn't look at them, you would physically move away and orient yourself away. Um, that would be ignoring the learner and the behavior. That's not always possible, and it doesn't always make sense. So there are some variations of that. Um, you could ignore the learner, but not the behavior. And what that means is that you're not going to deliver eye contact or talk to them, but you're physically going to redirect um, or, or um, in some other way keep the learner safe. So for example, if um, the inappropriate behavior is the child that um, ran and they are running in an unsafe area, they're running towards the street, safety is the priority. But instead of um, yelling and screaming and, and hollering at them to come back, or once you get them, talking to them and reprimanding them about how that wasn't safe, instead what you do, if they were running away for attention, just so we're clear, only for attention, um, you would physically catch them and keep them safe, and then use as little physical contact as possible to make sure that they stay safe and return to the area. But you wouldn't look at them, you wouldn't talk to them, you wouldn't provide any additional attention, only the amount needed to keep them physically safe. And that would be ignoring the learner, but not the behavior, because we can't ignore running away behavior. No one's asking you to ignore running away behavior if it's attention seeking. You have to keep your learner safe. Um, the third variation is ignore the behavior but not the learner. And this would be continuing with your, continuing with the situation as if the inappropriate behavior was not occurring um, and as if the learner was appropriately um, engaging. So for example, if the learner is um, using a, uh, we're going to say, using a whiny tone of voice that previously has resulted in getting a lot more of attention, um, so uh, maybe they're sort of like back talking a little bit, and usually or historically that has resulted in more attention because it really irritates the person that they're talking to. Um, instead of commenting on or reprimanding or reacting to that whiny or inappropriate tone, um, you would continue um, with whatever interaction you were having. So if I was the teacher and previously this um, student had been making um, uh, sort of that like mimicky tone of voice um, back to me when I was talking and they were doing it for attention, then I might continue with my um, lesson and not comment on it, not react to that inappropriate behavior, and potentially even if I asked them a direct question and they answered, but they answered it with um, an inappropriate tone or they did that sort of snarky tone, um, I might still, you know, comment on the correctness of the answer and just disregard the inappropriate tone. So that would be ignoring that particular behavior, but not the learner. You're still interacting with the learner. You're still continuing throughout your day, but you're not attending to that inappropriate behavior that is um, trying to get attention or reaction. Um, given your situation and the behavior, um, one of these may be uh, more appropriate than the other. Um, so when people say planned ignoring, it definitely doesn't mean that you. Um, 
that you let the kid do whatever they want. Um, and it definitely doesn't mean that you uh, risk the safety of the kid. Um, it's, you can't always, and you don't always, and you shouldn't always ignore the learner and the behavior. There are other ways to planfully ignore the inappropriate aspect or give as little attention as possible while still keeping the situation safe. Um, for escape maintained behavior, so this is someone trying to get out of having to do a task, um, the way to make it ineffective is to continue to present the demand. So again, there's a few different variations for this, and this one I would say more often than not progresses with um, size and age of learner. So if my two-year-old um, throws a fit and say that they don't want to go to bed, I can pick my two-year-old up and I can physically take them to bed. Um, I can provide physical guidance um, to, to get them to perform the appropriate task. I could take their hand, I can make them put the toy in the toy box. Um, physical guidance is only appropriate if the learner is not physically resistant to that. So we're not getting into a wrestling match here. Um, we're not fighting with our learner in order to ma physically make them do something. Um, this definitely shouldn't be a case of the bigger person gets their way. Um, but if your learner is, you know, more of the passive non-compliance, um, just not wanting to do something, and they're just going to lay there, you can, and they're not going to resist you, you can physically assist them or you can physically guide them through the next step. Um, but like I said, that generally only works for um, smaller kids because oftentimes our learners, um, especially learners that are engaging in inappropriate behavior, have figured out that, um, that physically somebody can't make them do something. And that's okay. We don't want to be physically made to do something either. We would almost all of us, I would think, would resist that if somebody tried to make us do something. Um, so then sort of the next step to that or, or an alternative to that would be to block access to anything else or the next activity or, or upcoming fun events until the learner completes the initial instruction. So for example, my parents always um, restricted access to dessert until I had eaten enough dinner. Um, so that would be an example. It's like, well, first you have to eat enough dinner, then you can have access to the dessert. Um, they're not going to give me dessert because I whine and cried for, um, uh, for candy. Um, you, so you may, um, you may do sort of a first then kind of a statement, um, or you may just kind of put the rest of the activities on hold. So, well, we can't go out to recess until you have your shoes on. Um, and then when they have their shoes on, then you can go um, to the next thing. You would um, basically sort of sit in a holding pattern um, and not, not go on to the next activity, not let them go on to the next activity um, until they follow through with the instruction. Um, some examples would be that, um, you know, computer time isn't available until homework is done. And if they, you know, and, and they just, they can sit at the table and, and sit there with their homework and either do it um, or they can um, not do it, but they still are going to be, you know, they're not going to get to go play video games. They're not going to be able to get on the computer. They're not going to be able to play with their toys until homework is complete. So that would be an example. Um, now, there are situations, especially like in school, where moving on to the next activity is, um, cannot be held forever. Um, recess is over at a certain time. Uh, math class is over at a certain time. And in those cases, or in situations where um, the, the task has a, an end point or the opportunity has an end point, um, then you should make sure that you come back to that instruction as soon as possible and not complete the task for the learner. 
that's how you're going to reduce the effectiveness of um, escape maintained behavior. So for example, um, if I asked my uh, child to clean up their toys, but now it's time to go to school, um, then we still have to go to school. I'm not going to let them miss school because they didn't clean up their toys. Um, but when we come back from school, then that's the, that's the expectation, is that we're going right back to this, it's time to clean up your toys. Um, and then potentially I would have the availability to, was to go back to the next one, block access to all the other fun and enjoyable and next activities until they're compliant. Um, again, depending upon your learner, depending upon the behavior, um, one of these will be more appropriate than the other. And for all of these things, um, I don't think I said it in the beginning, but everything that we're doing, we're talking in very general terms. This is not a specific behavior plan for, um, for your learner. Um, this is general information. And if you um, want more specific or need more help need help with a um, more specific behavior intervention plan um, you can seek out some behavioral supports um, uh, if you need a list of resources you can email me and my email address will be here at the end um, but one of these would be uh, more would make sense for whatever your situation is and this is for escape maintained behavior um, Another way to reduce the effectiveness of inappropriate behavior would be time out. Um, time out is, uh, the, the full term is time out from reinforcement. So it's basically time out from the fun and the attention. So this can work for attention and tangible functions, um, but it is not appropriate for escape. So in my example about the kid that got sent out of math class, if he didn't want to be in math class anyway, and now he's in a timeout, timeout's going to be fun for him. He wants to get out of it. He's trying to escape that task. Taking a timeout is reinforcing the behavior. So this is where um, we definitely need to know the function of inappropriate behaviors because just saying put your kid in timeout when they hit may not work if your kid is hitting to get out of something, then time out is reinforcing the behavior instead of actually serving to decrease the behavior. Um, so the literature and the research supports only um, a matter of needing one to three minutes in a time out situation, um, but the remaining or the last 10 to 15 seconds of that timeout needs to be calm behavior. So if I, um, if the learner is in a timeout and, um, and I set the timer for one minute, um, I'm actually, so here's how I do it, back step a little bit. Um, one minute might be the timeout. However, the last 10 to 15 seconds have to be calm. So I probably just um, set my stopwatch for, um, uh, for a minute and then I watch and I make sure that the last 10 or 15 seconds are calm and if they're still fussing while they're in timeout um, at one minute, then I just wait until there are 10 to 15 seconds of calm behavior. And then I say, okay, you can get out of timeout. Um, I don't set a timer because what if they're throwing a fit right when the timer goes off? Um, then they may not, um, they're not calm, so they're not really ready to rejoin the activity appropriately. And they may uh, accidentally learn that, well, as long as I throw a fit, then I can get out of it. Even though it was time-based, they may be viewing it as, well, I threw a fit and that's why I got out. Um, so you want to make sure you have calm behavior. So I tend not to use timers. Um, I just watch the clock myself so that I can guarantee that I am letting the learner out of timeout when they are calm and appropriate. Um, now timeout can take um, a couple of different forms. Oh, going back to the minutes real fast. The, the adage about one minute for each year, um, it's not necessary. Um, if a seven-year-old, um, you know, if you put a seven-year-old in timeout, seven minutes isn't necessary. Um, pretty much longer than three minutes is not necessary so long as they are calm at the end of it. 
Now, a learner may end up in timeout for longer than one to three minutes because they're still throwing a fit. Um, and, and that behavior is all on them. Um, but you are not requiring someone who is already calm to sit there for longer than is necessary. Once the learner has calmed down, then um, it's appropriate to let them rejoin the activity. Um, timeout can be in the same room or in a different room, um, in the same area or in a different area. There's a couple of different variations that I've used. Um, when I was doing a, working in a preschool classroom, we did what we called a sit and watch. So if an individual engaged in inappropriate behavior, usually grabbing a toy from another kid, um, we would basically just kind of come up behind them, uh, put our hands behind their shoulders and, sit, and, and, and have them sit down, um, basically just right at the edge of the play space. Um, and they would sit there. Um, you know, new kids, you had to like, put them back down and say, and, and remind them, sit here um, a couple of times, but they would sit there, they'd sit for a minute, and then we'd come up and we'd say, okay, go play. Um, but they were right there and they could see all of their friends who were playing appropriately, um, but they weren't allowed to play at that moment. Um, also, you know, I mean, I, I uh, grew up and was uh, sent to the corner. Um, you could you could move to a separate place in the area. Um, you could also uh, one activity or one um, colleague of mine. Uh, they had those slap bracelets. He was running a middle school um, social group, and they basically had slap bracelets. And if the learners engaged in an inappropriate behavior, the instructor just took the slap bracelet for that time period. Um, when they were engaging in an activity, they could only participate if they had their slap bracelet. So they could only have a turn if they had a slap bracelet. So um, not having it, you couldn't take your turn, but then once you had it back, um, you could uh, rejoin the group. But physically, the, the kids were all still um, standing in line or they were all still um, out on the, out in the park space um, where they were interacting. There wasn't a separate area that they had to go to. Um, now, some important aspects of uh, time out. Um, it's time out from the fun and the attention. Um, so we want to make sure that time out is, does not result in more attention. Um, we don't want to talk to the individual while they're in time out because they are then getting attention, perhaps one-on-one -on -one attention, which could be the reason that they engaged in inappropriate behavior to begin with. Um, so if you do feel like you want to work on a more appropriate behavior or you want to problem solve with a learner um, after an inappropriate behavior that you use time out for, you want to make sure that they have rejoined the group and are engaged appropriately prior to you addressing that problem behavior. So again, we don't want to create an accidental sequence where we give, um, where we engage in the appropriate behavior or we give um, more attention after problem behavior has occurred. Instead, the learner goes to timeout, timeout is over, they come back, they play, and then after they're playing appropriately, then that might be where we go up and we pull them aside and we say, hey, what can we do next time when that situation comes up? And that's if you feel like you need to um, verbally revisit that situation. Uh, behaviorally speaking, if time in is reinforcing, so if they are enjoying the fun and the attention in their environment, then time out for an inappropriate behavior will be effective even if you never say or talk about what that is. Just that natural contingency um, of oh, every time I hit, I have to go sit out and I don't get to play. That can be enough. And you may not have to even verbally describe it to the learner. But if you want to, make sure that you're doing it after they're appropriate so that you're not, I'm in timeout. Oh, but now I get one-on-one -on -one attention in timeout with the teacher or with mom and dad or with my parent. All right. So, 
let's review and we're going to go over our examples um, with some example behavior plans and then we'll have time for questions. So first you need to identify the function of the behavior. Um, the four main functions are um, everybody eats, escape, attention, tangible, and self-stimulatory. Um, when you take your ABC data, what's the antecedent? What's the behavior? What's the consequence? And you look for those patterns. You can look to identify what is the common result, what is the common function of the behavior that the learner is getting, and therefore what they are um, getting out of their inappropriate behavior. So once we identify that function of the behavior, we need to implement a function-based intervention, and it's going to have a step that addresses the A, the B, and the C. So A, we're going to arrange the environment to reduce the motivation, reduce the likelihood that the learner needs to act out to get something because that something is already um, available more often in their environment. For the B, we're going to teach an alternative appropriate replacement behavior that serves the same function as the inappropriate behavior but is easier to perform. So it's still getting the learner's needs met but it's doing it in a more appropriate way um, on our terms um, instead of an inappropriate way on their terms. And then for the C, the consequence, how do we respond to the inappropriate behavior? We need to reduce inappropriate behavior by making it ineffective. Um, we want to make sure that our, uh, that the inappropriate behavior no longer gets what it, what, um, the learner is trying to get out of it so that they see that the appropriate behavior is going to get their way and the inappropriate behavior is not going to get their way anymore. Um, this is why we want to make sure that our appropriate behavior does get them what they want so that they use that instead of the inappropriate behavior. Um, and then we need to make sure that we're consistent. And consistency not only means that every time I do this, I do it the same way, but that everyone or as many people as possible that interact with this learner are following the same plan. That's gonna make it easier for the learner to understand that this inappropriate behavior doesn't work. It doesn't work at home, it doesn't work at school, it doesn't work at grandma's house, it doesn't work out in the community. This inappropriate behavior does not work. There are all these appropriate behaviors that work instead. So we're going to revisit our examples and we're going to talk through the um, possible uh, function-based intervention. So those of you that can type into the chat, um, I'll be asking you about possible interventions. I'm going to walk through the first example though. So this is Johnny. Johnny's the one that yells out during class when the teacher tells him what to do. He yells out the opposite and his peers laugh and he gets their attention. So for example, arranging the environment. Um, we might um, provide a lot of attention from the teacher for staying on task and we might also have peers compliment the learner for staying on task. We might also set up opportunities for this learner to engage with his peers in, um, in you know, team activities or group activities or pick a partner to do this work um, or give this learner access to some social groups so that they have more opportunities to interact with their peers besides getting their peers to laugh when they yell out in class. For the behavior, we want to teach an alternative response. Um, we could teach them to ask to work for a friend or maybe teach them to ask to tell a joke so that everyone can laugh. Um, again, right now, we're not concerned with whether or not this is the right time for telling a joke, but telling a joke, um, asking to tell a joke and being allowed by the teacher to tell a joke is more appropriate than blurting out the opposite of what the teacher is saying and disrupting the whole class. So again, we're, we're switching, getting the laughter of your peers to something under our terms where the teacher can say, and before we do this independent task, you know, you want to do a joke. Um, 
Our consequence, we want to reduce the effectiveness of the inappropriate behavior. In this case, because it's attention seeking, we would want to use planned ignoring. Um, but because it's in the classroom and there's responding, we might ignore the behavior, but not the learner. Now, since this learner was engaging for peer attention, depending upon the age of your peers, um, it may be more important to make sure that the peers are following along with this behavior plan. So um, you could do a couple of different things. Sometimes, um, sometimes kids are very receptive to the idea of um, just following the instruction of, okay, you know, we're, we're not going to laugh at, in, at these uh, inappropriate behaviors anymore. I want everybody to pretend like it isn't happening and just focus on what I'm saying. Um, again, depending upon the age and maybe the motivation of your peers, that may not always work, um, but potentially the teacher in this classroom could create a reward system for learners who aren't laughing. So learners who um, continue, peers that continue to attend to the teacher in spite of inappropriate behavior. There might be points or um, reinforcers or praise available for those individuals. So you could teach your peers um, not to respond that way. And so therefore the learner um, is still being interacted with within the classroom, but nobody is laughing at the yelling out the opposite anymore. All right, so our second example was Jack, who um, is uh, running away when he was out in public or running out the door when, he, um, when no one is watching him by the door. Um, and they physically chase him to catch him, and then they take him back and we had talked about how the function was um, potentially attention and tangible access. So any ideas on antecedents, ways we can arrange the environment so that the learner is less likely to run away? Great, I'm seeing some comments. Um, uh, putting a deadbolt on the door. Yeah, so they just physically can't get out. Um, giving some more access to the outside so that they get to go outside in a safe opportunity more often and outside is not that motivating. Um, distraction, so maybe redirecting them or keeping them engaged, um, especially for that attention piece. If you are engaged with them and they're already receiving attention, then they're less likely to um, run away to get it. Um, what about a replacement behavior? What do you think might be uh, some good replacement behaviors for this learner? Asking to go outside, yep, that's a great one. Yep, and activities that involve running or asking to go for a run or asking to play chase. Um, I see start off holding the parent's hand. That would be a great antecedent strategy um, where you are, um, you're keeping the learner safe. I don't know, um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen those. Um, they have those backpacks for little toddlers with like a leash on them. Um, you know, if your toddler is likely to run away and you're going to be in a spot, then maybe that's a good way to keep them safe and, and reduce the likelihood. Um, uh, but we want to look at how can they get their needs met. So maybe we, um, maybe we get them to uh, ask to go outside, ask to play chase, ask to go for a run. Um, and then I am going to give you guys another example of the extinction because the extinction piece is a little harder. Um, so we talked about antecedent um, strategies. Um, we could give acts or, uh, some of the ones that I came up with pre-corrects. So reminding before you go outside in public with parents, reminding the kid to hold their hand, um, giving them outdoor play in safe fenced areas so that they can run around um, and they have access to that, but in an okay, um, safe environment. 
replacement behaviors, asking to go outside, asking to play chase, um, maybe just asking for attention from the parent in general. And then the consequence in this case, because it's attention seeking, um, it, it involves that intention seeking piece, we could use planned ignoring, but we wanna make sure that we're using the one that does not ignore the behavior. So we're still going to catch the child and keep them safe um, if they were to run away, despite all of our planning and, and teaching those alternative responses. Um, we're going to keep them safe, but we are not going to be um, yelling and screaming as at them to stop because we already know this learner doesn't, um, doesn't listen to that instruction. We're going to provide as little attention as possible. So we might hold their hand, but we're not gonna make a big deal out of it. Um, and we're gonna continue back to what we were doing before. But we're gonna make sure that that learner stays safe. All right, example three, um, Julie throwing tantrums when she's told to clean up. Um, parents come into the room, then she asks nicely. So we look at uh, where potentially that behavior has been shaped up where, you know, well, I'll ask, but only after I throw a fit. Um, and then they help her clean up. So we had determined that this could be some attention and some escape. What would be some antecedent strategies for attention and escape that we could provide to Julie so that she's less likely to engage in problem behavior for, um, for having to uh, clean up her room? Show a demonstration help her clean it throughout the week so that it's not um, so overwhelming at the end, make the task more attainable. I think that's kind of the same thing. Like maybe instead of cleaning her whole room, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but my kids can wreck a room so fast. Um, maybe we just work as, focus on one piece. Let's clean up the blocks. Let's clean up the Barbies. Let's clean up the, Play-Doh um, and just focus on one piece so that the task is more manageable. Um, yeah, allowing more breaks, providing more attention too. Um, if we can provide more attention throughout the day, you know, perhaps um, she's less likely to engage in um, inappropriate behavior for attention at the end. Um, replacement behavior, what would be an, a more appropriate way for her to get attention or um, get a break or get help? Oh, I like that, a checklist. Yep, giving her a visual checklist of what to complete. Absolutely. There we go, a replacement behavior that she's asking in an appropriate manner prior to you coming in, um, ideally prior to her screaming, but if not, then you're, um, uh, that she's engaging in that appropriate request for help or appropriate request to come out um, for you to come and help um, politely. Um, when you're giving the direction, maybe prompting her to ask for help. Absolutely, yeah, especially when we talked about teaching it and teaching it errorlessly. Like, as you're finishing the sentence, it's time to clean your room. Remember, you can ask for help. <laughs> um, that might be sufficient so that she's asking before she's screaming about it. Excellent. And then in this case, our um, inappropriate, our, our consequence is gonna be um, a little bit of both, so we'll go over that one. So antecedent, we could provide frequent attention throughout the day. We could maybe provide some options about when to clean or how much to clean or where things go. Um, sometimes the escape aspect of, um, of that inappropriate behavior may be because somebody is calling the shots. And if we can give them the chance to make some more choices and make some more decisions, have a little bit more independence, then they're less likely to try and escape our instructions because they do have a little bit of a say in it. Um, 
replacement behaviors, teaching to um, ask for help, ask for attention, ask for a break. Um, potentially, you could work on teaching her to come out of her room and come and um, get attention from the parent. You know, go to them and say, um, excuse me, can you please help me clean my room instead of screaming in her room until they come. And then the consequence for the attention seeking behavior. In this case, this would be an okay time to ignore the child and the behavior. They're in their room. All she does is um, scream. She's not likely to hurt herself. There's not a safety concern. And we can ignore the behavior. She's in her room. I can go somewhere else. I could put on headphones. I could go do something else um, and allow her to throw her fit until she, um, you know, wears herself out a little bit and, and is calmer. Um, now, the continue to present the demand. You might say, well, how am I going to continue to present the demand if I'm ignoring her? And that is tricky. Um, but what you could do, this would be a case of, you know, blocking access to other things. So she cannot, you know, she can't have the snack. Um, she can't, uh, you know, come out and watch TV. She can't um, move on to whatever the next activity or the next preferred um, activity would be until the room is clean. Um, and that arrangement, you know, assuming that those things are not in her room, if those things are outside of the room, then that's how you could monitor that aspect. Um, I would say that if she has access to things that she's more likely to play with in the room instead of cleaning, then um, then you would probably not be uh, able to implement that in the same way. But again, these are going to vary depending upon the learner and the situation. All right, last example. Um, Jenny engages in screaming, not aggression, when brushing her teeth. Um, uh, Jenner, uh, initially she'll comply with the instruction. However, when she is prompted um, or given that corrective feedback that she missed the spot, then she engages in screaming that she already did it and um, she does that to escape because then she doesn't have to do those hard areas. So what would be some antecedents? And I think somebody had one earlier. What would be some antecedent uh, strategies that you could use to help um, her uh, be more successful and reduce the likelihood of problem behavior during brushing teeth. Um, so yes, show her how to give a demonstration, um, give a visual that shows all of the areas to hit, um, maybe a checklist. Um, Yep, of using video modeling, um, brush with a kid's video of brushing, yeah, so they can brush along, um, making it fun. So that's talking rewards and teaching the appropriate. We're jumping a little bit ahead to the reinforcement uh, category. Um, antecedent strategies, we want to look at if she's engaging in escape from um, the correction, then we're looking at ways that she can. Um, basically escape correction or take breaks or um, be more independent in this case, um, be more independent prior to this particular situation. So maybe since she's five years old, five years old is generally when kids are trying to do a lot of stuff by themselves. They think they can do everything by themselves. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, um, a lot of kids that do that at a lot of ages. Um, but showing her, praising her, acknowledging the things that she can do independently, um, and therefore escaping any sort of corrective um, feedback. Um, another one, turning her teeth blue. Yeah, those mouthwashes that turn colors so that then you have to brush them off, but then you can see with, whether you got a spot or not. Excellent. Um, Alternative behaviors, replacement behaviors for um, escaping brushing teeth. A laminated mouth, right, where they practiced brushing it. Okay. 
So you could work on the brushing skills separately, like in um, an activity, especially one that's away from actually brushing the teeth, um, so that they can uh, practice the appropriate teeth brushing um, situation. Um, yeah, that would be great. And then for um, consequences, um, in order to make the behavior ineffective, what would we do for escape behavior? I'm gonna let you guys answer this time. Yep, gotta do it right, absolutely. Um, you don't move on until the next activity. Um, she is, they said they're currently using verbal or visual prompting. Um, if she's receptive, you might be able to say like, here, let me show you and help her physically to do it. Um, she could be receptive to that. Um, if not, then again, sort of the, the we, we don't move on. Um, you know, we're not done with toothbrushing, you know, first brush the back and then you can be done with toothbrushing. Um, um, brushing your teeth at the same time, yep, that might be a good visual, a good model, another way to prompt and provide some of that feedback um, in, a, in a way that she's less likely to engage in problem behavior. Um, yeah, so visual lifts of steps could be arranging the environment, other opportunities to be independent and be acknowledged for being independent so that she's escaping that corrective feedback piece. Um, she's not only receiving corrective feedback, she's getting praise for all of these independent opportunities. Um, teaching her how to brush her teeth independently. Um, also teaching her to ask for approval. So um, if she is, um, if she is uh, seeking to be correct um, and to not be told she's wrong, then sometimes that is a good opportunity to teach how to appropriately request some, some praise or some feedback, some acknowledgement. Um, and then a consequence, we would want to continue to present the demand. Again, depending upon the learner, that might be that you can physically help her to brush those parts um, if she's not resistant to that. Or it could be um, where, you know, you guys, um, you start your bedtime routine a little bit earlier because you might be in there for a little bit longer before she complies with the, the task or allows you to help her um, comply with getting those areas. So now it's time for questions. Um, also, there's my email address and my office phone number. So if you have follow-up questions or if you want to um, get a, um, um, a copy of the slides, you can email me at rachel, R-A-C-H-E-L, at alaskachd.org. Um, or my office phone number is 907-264-6239. Does anyone have any questions? You 